And welcome to Diminishing Returns, where dum 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 we're talking about Bond again in anticipation of the latest Bond film, No Time to Die. So, I've been on a bit of a digital detox since our last record, Sol yeah. and Alan. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to need you guys to update me on some of the uh, hype as we come closer and closer to No Time to Die, which is releasing in April. You've been avoiding all Bond news, haven't you? <laughs> Yes, because yes. you didn't want any any spoilers or anything coming your way. No, nope, uh, nope, not a thing. I, I've been completely without internet for the last uh, last few day, last few weeks. I I hate to tell you, Carvin, I've got some really bad news. Oh, Peter Rabbit Two has been officially postponed because of uh, fears over coronavirus. <gasps> Oh, oh no. no! Has anyone oh, told goodness. James Corden? James Corden vehicle, <laughs> Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway. Good lord. Delayed no. four months to August. Four months? That's that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Four months? Yeah. I can't believe that. That is an overreaction, if ever well, I, was. I, I mean, I think it's probably like they're just like, we'll get it out of the way of the period where coronavirus will be at its peak, but obviously, mm. as soon as that's done... It can go right out into cinemas and compete with all the other films going out. Well, hey, that's <laughs> that's James Corden's problem. We've got a lovely new Daniel Craig film to look forward to. It's all, I don't know. Uh, should we just... More like seven months to die, Alan. <laughs> what? <laughs> look, Calvin, the Bond film's been postponed. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and they pushed it back seven months to November <laughs> because they obviously know that it can't begin to compete with all the real films coming out in this summer, like yeah. uh, Marvel, Black Widow, like pretend Bond pastiche <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, they're just yeah. steering clear of all the competition because James Bond's yeah. shit. Oh, <laughs> I mean, if we can. Uh... Just uh, skip past this fantastic acting that Calvin's doing. <laughs> we just, uh, yes. Um, yes, of course, we we planned a double bond uh, extravaganza to to lead us into No Time to Die. We've been delayed, but we're sticking with our plans. We are currently in a bunker uh, under London, um, protected from the coronavirus, which is um, currently death toll currently at forty seven million globally. Um, so that's quite bad. <laughs> But uh, you know, it's our fault. We, we're here. We're, we're still, we let Japanese we're still... Bond in. We let him in. <laughs> oh God! When he had the, he was carrying it. Yeah, shit. Yeah. Well, we're we're going to broadcast to the bitter end. We're actually going. Oh, we're going on. Uh, we're broadcasting on emergency frequencies now uh, because we couldn't let Bond fans down. The could be Broccoli would, and he, no, he's dead. Uh, whoever could be Broccoli is now. They'd let you down by postponing seven You mean months. Babs? You mean Cubby Broccoli's daughter Barbara B- and Big Babs, stepson yeah. Michael? Yeah, that's right. Uh, they'd let you down every time by delaying you for seven months. But we're going to give you double bond anyway because fuck them. The Bond fans need something. This was going to be quite a perfect tie-in, sort of like the first Bond of what I would call a more modern style of Bond with Pierce Brosnan and Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson producing and then we were going this was going to be tying into the last Daniel Craig Bond film, those two producing again. It was all going to work very nicely. And now I guess we'll be looking at Tomorrow Never Dies mm-hmm. for when <laughs> No Time to Die comes out, maybe. Who knows? We might have got a few in by then. It's a long time. So I, I I think we should try and get to Die in the Day by the time uh Bond film That's, comes out. What is that? Three films? Four films? Plausible. Uh, yep. That seems quite doable. plausible, yeah. yeah, yeah hmm. But of course, um, I mean, are they, uh, 
are they worried because obviously the coronavirus it's it's more likely to affect the elderly and infirm. Are they worried about Daniel Craig? He is. <laughs> oh, is he in his late fifties now? No. He's fifty-two. <laughs> They're worried about all the people who still like James Bond. There, I'm, you know? I'm a bit worried about Sean Connery, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sort of not, Billy. He's not. The, he's not. The you most, can catch uh, it from dogs. A fit and agile person anymore. So Billy the vet needs to watch out. <laughs> While I think there are obviously good public health reasons for uh, for the postponement, I think primarily it well, that's come not down what they've done. Money. It. Yeah. No, no, exactly. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, you've got, well, I think all cinemas are closed in Italy now, and then China obviously has a lot of major shut, shut down. China's a major market. That's There's no telling how it's going to go over the next few weeks. Did Mulan uh, come weeks. out as not as expected? Uh, it is coming out. It's not out yet, I think. We should probably tell people we're recording this on Tuesday, March 10th, because who knows what state the world is going to be in by the time <laughs> this actually goes out. It's like something out of a James Bond movie. It's, it's pretty interesting just to watch it unfold, because it's, it's like a dry run for when like, the real a, one hits. like a real scary thing happening, like a zombie movie. And I, I, mm. I, I as I said on Twitter earlier today, I, I think, if nothing else, we can expect a really great satirical zombie movie in two years' time. Mm. Oh yeah, that'll be great. Uh, um... <laughs> the genre needs a shot in the arm, Alan. It needs some fresh uh, <laughs> spin. I keep saying this to people, it, like regardless of how scary it is, it's it's got like catastrophically huge economic impact. Like that, like James Bond's a perfect example of this. I, I read an analysis yesterday that said they uh, stand to lose, I think, fifty million dollars from the postponing. Of no time mm, to die. Yeah. It cost them that just yeah. to get the marketing up and running again in six months. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is it. This is sort of what I wanted to lead into. Um, kind of the effect that this has on the film, which was only a month away from release. Obviously, films get their release date postponed because of, you know, poor test screenings, visual effects, need retweaking, what have you. I can't think of another instance where a film on this scale has been postponed because of, like, a public health concern. Mm. On this scale, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's happened with smaller films, not public health, but, you mm. know, very, very famously a few years ago, the, the North Korean Sony hacks led to um, mm. uh, the interview being pulled because they were worried about some threats from North Korea. Um, mm. more recently, The Hunt, which is coming out very soon, actually. Uh, Blumhouse film was yanked from the, the schedule because of some, uh, I think it was concern over mass shootings and class war and, and themes within the film mm. that that might link to. Um, it, it does happen, but yeah, it's usually not a, an A-list blockbuster on, on, this sort of scale. Especially with the kinds of tie-ins that Bond has, and products, brands, uh, Daniel Craig on Saturday Night Live and things like that, all that stuff was being lined up and well underway, yeah. and then the rug has just been suddenly pulled, and now I'm going to be really fascinated to see what they do closer to November, really, uh, if they have to develop a whole new marketing strategy. or um, I, They can't just put out the same posters again, like with a change of date, surely. They can, they're just going to take it all away. They're going to take Billie mm. Eilish No Time to Die off Spotify and then put it up again in, in <laughs> August. I mean maybe maybe that's what they will do. It's <laughs> highly possible. They're not uh, they're going to get they're going to get someone in to do a better song and release that instead. No. <laughs> but yeah, so uh if you're out there mm. listening to this and sorry that your business has gone out of uh, uh, into liquidation. I'm sorry that your parents are dead. But, you know, Bond or, will go on. Thank you for spending your entire two-week quarantine binging episodes of this podcast. Yes. You've made it to the end. Well <laughs> yeah, yeah. And congratulations if you, if you were stockpiling toilet paper up until the end of February. You're now quits mm. in. Yeah, you can sell them. Mm. Sell them yeah. at a profit mm. at 20 pence a roll. Mm. I've been using pages from old books for the past week. <laughs> <laughs> While all the stocks are low in the stock market, I'm going to buy some of them 
Ooh. And then they'll go up again, won't they? That's right. That's literally the plot of a Bond <laughs> film in a couple of uh, films' time. <laughs> so, right. let's, let's uh, you know, dispense with our um, topical work here and go back to 1995, uh, when mm. everything was great. Boo. The world was a beautiful place. The Cold War was over. Soviet Union collapsed. Communism finally defeated until China became into existence in yeah, about 2007. Yeah. 9-11 still meant the 9th of November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so how do you reinvigorate Bond for a, for a new generation? Mm. Spice Girls. <laughs> Just a touch too early for the Spice Girls. But yeah, Calvin, give us... Tina Turner. Give us yeah, Tina Turner, obviously, yeah, the, the original girl power. Um, give us the uh, the inside uh, information here. What happened between 1989 and 1995 in the Bond world? Oh, a lot. The series uh, was uh, holed up with a lot of legal problems. They were willing and raring to go for a third Timothy Dalton Bond film, but because... Uh, when you say MGM... they were willing, you don't mean Timothy Dalton. Uh, no, well, no, he was actually at the time. If if the third one had come out in like 1991 or 92 as planned, he would have done it. He would have been in it. Yeah. Uh, but there were a load of legal issues at MGM, uh, who own uh, a stake in the in the Bond series, or is that United Artists? I don't know. The rights to Bond are all over the place. It's no sort of like one person that I did owns notice it. the United Artists logo at the beginning of Goldeneye when I watched it. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. The rights are sort of all over the place. And by the time all of that legal stuff was sorted out, they were, they, they, Timothy Dalton was going to come back and do his third, the last one he was contracted to do, but they wanted to sign him on for more because a great deal of time had passed, and they said, if we're going to be relaunching the series, we need someone to stick with this for a while, and yeah. he said no, and walked off. So that's when they went crawling back to Pierce Brosnan, who they'd uh, already cast in 1987, yeah. but uh, he couldn't get out of his Remington Steel contract, and as such, he lost the part, and now he finally gets it. What is Remington yeah. Steel? Is he like a lawyer? No, it's a type of razor blade he's just sh- for shavers. Oh. It's a TV show in which P- Pierce Brosnan played, I think, a man called Remington Steel. I've never actually seen an episode of it. Uh, but he and his female companion would go around, I believe, she's solving steel. mysteries. He's Remington. She's Steel. Is that true? I don't know. Oh, okay. He's, <laughs> he's Steve Remington. She's Karen Steel. <laughs> it was originally called Steve and Karen Investigate. Try this for a deep, dark secret. The great detective Remington Steele? He doesn't exist. I invented him. Follow. I always loved excitement. So I studied and apprenticed and put my name on an office. But absolutely nobody knocked down my door. A female private investigator seemed so feminine. So I invented a superior. A decidedly masculine superior. Suddenly there were cases around the block. It was working like a charm, until the day he walked in, with his blue eyes and mysterious past. And before I knew it, he assumed Remington Steele's identity. Now I do the work, and he takes the vows. It's a dangerous way to live, but as long as people buy it, I can get the job done. We never mix business with pleasure. Well, almost never. From not what I know about it, the mystery of each episode would usually be solved by Pierce Brosnan's character being like, Aha! This is just like in Casablanca, starring Humphrey Bogart and, uh, <laughs> uh, what's the name, the other one? God, what's the name? Not Lauren Bacall. <laughs> Ingrid Bergman, that's it. And and then, the, 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 from his vast movie knowledge, they would solve the crime or mystery oh, or whatever. really? It was, it was a play. Did he ever go, as far as I understand, Oh, this is just like James Bond. <laughs> he might have, have actually done. done. Must have done. I'm looking up Remington Steel. Hang on. Okay. What so... is he? Is he a lawyer? Is he a vet? What is he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I'll give you. I'll give you the Wikipedia uh, information. Remington Steel's premise is that Laura Holt, a licensed private investigator played by Stephanie Zimbalist, opened a detective agency under her own name, but found potential clients refused to hire a woman, no matter how qualified. <laughs> to solve the problem, Laura invents a fictitious male superior. She names Remington Steel. This sounds Head great. Through a series of events in the first episode, Pierce Brosnan's character, a former thief and con man, 
uh, assumes the identity of Remington Steele, and behind the scenes a power struggle ensues between Laura and Steele as to who is really in charge, while the two carry on a casual romantic relationship. Oh. <laughs> Sounded good up until that Brilliant. last bit. The first episode was called License to Steal. <laughs> it's good really? pun. Works. So there you go. Good joke. That's how. That's the influence of Bond uh, in mm. 1982. <laughs> I'm just looking at the episode list for Remington Steel. All these glorious puns. Like every other episode <laughs> is a pun on the word steel. <laughs> like they think they're clever <laughs> for noticing that steel with an e on the end is similar to the metal steel. <laughs> <laughs> Episode two is called Tempered Steel. Stainless Steel? Uh, that's probably on there. There's one called Thou Shalt Not Steal. <laughs> yeah, oh, there's dear. one called Etched in Steel. <laughs> uh, oh, this is this one's a bit f- clever. Your Steel, the one for me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Stealing the show. Steel flying high. Every every single episode is just a pun on steel. <laughs> I want to look at series five when they start really getting desperate. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead. Let's see what we can find. Uh, season five, the final season. Steel hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> is that actually one of them? Yeah, part one and part two. It was a two parter. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the final episode, the finale, is a two-parter called Steeled with a Kiss. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't even get it. <laughs> is, that a, is that a pun? It's sealed with a kiss. Oh, of course. Sealed with a kiss. Of course. <laughs> oh, well, you know. Premium steel. Corn-fed steel. What does, what's that? What's <laughs> Clubbing a baby steel. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, hey, anyway, <laughs> Santa Claus is coming to steal. What? That must be the <laughs> that must be the Christmas episode. <laughs> That's not even that doesn't even work. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this show sounds amazing, Calvin. Have you ever watched it? No, I haven't. No, no. But I'd like to. Ooh, ooh, Bonds of Steel. Mm. Right. So, Goldeneye. Uh. Has a lot of the same creative behind the scenes team as previous ones, but with crucially different uh, people at writing and a new director. So it's got a very different feel right off the bat, I think, to the previous five films, all John Glenn films, all which more or less look a very similar way. Do you agree? I wouldn't say very. Okay. I mean, it's, it's it's the biggest change this franchise has had up until yeah. this point. But they have pretty much put out the same film like 20 times at this point. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely got a, ni- a mid 90s feel to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. uh it doesn't feel like a lot better. Mm. It, it like I don't want to say it's better. Does it does it feel different? I'll tell you what the major difference is if we're mm. going to get into it. It's Bond. Right, Pierce Brosnan's yeah. Bond is a significant difference, and I think that informs the whole thing. Mm. And if if I may say straight up, I think he might be my favourite Bond so far. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm so excited. I think, I think they really nailed it with Pierce Brosnan, or the way he's doing it. Because, we know, Timothy Dalton went a bit more stern with it, and I kind of like that. But with this... And I'm mostly just judging this on Goldeneye at the moment. Mm. Pierce Brosnan really plays this as a kind of cheeky schoolboy. Mm. That's how he interacts, certainly when he's interacting with authority figures like M and Q. Mm. But also with Money Penny, also with the, the main Bond woman. You know, he's always like, he's cheeky and he gets away with it because he's like, you know, he's a nice guy. Um, mm. But he can still s- smack someone in the face. He He can jump around a bit. He, you know, mm. if you can, if you can have a gunfight in a three-piece suit, you know, you, you're okay as Bond. That's that's what you need to be able to do. Mm. But then he's got a charm about him as well. Mm. Um, I think it's really the balance is just right here for me. 
That is often a criticism lobbied at him, that he is sort of jack of all trades, master of none. I think it's a matter Mm -hmm. of taste, and I think it works. I think he does blend a a lot of the elements that made the previous one successful. Like, obviously, Roger Moore was your more jokey Bond. Uh, Connery was perhaps a bit more ruthless, like Dalton. Uh, And I think that Brosnan does well to bring all those things together. Yeah. I totally believe him when he's being serious and he has to kill someone or he has to, you know, threaten someone or whatever. Mm. But he can still do the little wink to camera and, and go, oh, just keeping the British end up, oi oi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot better than Roger Moore could ever do it. Like, mm. never convinced by him. Mm. Mm. So, Sol, do you what wanna... do you feel about that? Uh... Um, yeah, I think I agree, more or less. I mean, I, I, I don't think it was that drastic a difference to be honest to it like i was expecting i i kind of went into it thinking oh i bet pierce brosnan's gonna be the best one and i'll i'll click with him because of everything you just said and i watched it and it was like yeah he's just kind of there and he's fine he's doing it mm-hmm. he's not embarrassing himself so that's something <laughs> The film is mm-hmm. lacking slightly on the yeah the the um the romantic angle. Mm. I mean, not even not even romantic angle. The sort of the Bond sexy time angle. I guess doesn't have to be romantic. This is again a, a kind of a broad point here, which we can get into more details later. But they the writers still haven't got a grasp on sort of organic, realistic feeling love story, or even a realistic feeling sex story. It's just mm. like there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Oh, let's fuck, mm. um, and that's that's all we get. The uh, the Bond girl, Bond woman, whatever term you prefer, uh, in this one is uh, Natalia, and she's played by Isabella Skorupko, an actress who I think it's a shame she had a, quite a sort of promising start with this, and she got offered plenty of other sort of Hollywood roles after this, but she uh, turned them all down. And just lived a life back in Poland, I believe. Uh, well, she had she had a kid in ninety seven. I was looking her up, yeah, mm. and like that can sometimes throw people off, you know, when you have mm. kids, you just think, ah, this is more important to me. Yeah, but, yeah. She, I noticed she did because it said I read something that she would turned down the role in uh, Zorro, the Catherine Zeta Jones role. Yeah, oh. which was directed by um, Martin Campbell. Is that his name? Martin Campbell. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But she yeah. was in Vertical Limit, which was also directed by Martin Campbell. Mm. So I think I think maybe he liked her. Nobody else mm. was really bothered in Hollywood. <laughs> That's she my theory. She got offered the uh, Kim Basinger role in L.A. Confidential, I believe. Yeah. Which would have been a, a big one. I mean, Kim Basinger was Oscar nominated for that. Yeah, but it's, it, 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 it does... I mean, it feels like she chose to walk away rather than she just couldn't get the work. Oh, definitely. That's the impression yeah. I got. But mm. in 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 terms of Goldeneye, which I think is probably the only thing I've ever seen her in, um, fine. I kind of like what they do with the character, where her and Bond do go head to head. She doesn't just you know swoon at the sight of him and all that. Mm. I I like that. I prefer that. This is you know the mid nineties girl power. And <laughs> but I found her. Just lacking in a little bit of personality. There's nothing much there to really get a hold of. Mm. See, I, I quite like her, but I I think I I do have a, an attraction to this actress. I think she's I think she looks great for a start. I think she is pro- probably the most beautiful Bond woman uh, uh, oh, really? in any of these films. Yeah, I think she's quite gorgeous, and I, I I think she's got a bit of a cheekiness to her. She's got a bit of spunk. Uh, I believe yeah. her in the character. And I like that she's... It's not a case of in a lot of these Bond films, you tend to find that the main Bond girl doesn't even turn up until about an hour in. And this one is yeah. very much a part of the story throughout it. Yeah. And I like that. I like that. I, I It felt like she was far more organically woven into the plot than mm. the Bond girls typically are. It yeah. felt like it made sense that she was there and involved. Mm. Yeah, and and I think they did get this balance quite well here, which they've struggled with in the past. Well, they didn't even care previously, but in mm. terms of giving her validation t- with Bond, as in ha- giving her actual purpose, Bond mm. needs her, but ultimately he's still in charge. You know, she doesn't take shit from him, but ultimately she knows that when he says do this, you got to go and do it. Um, yeah, but then sometimes she'll just like, hey, 
Who's who's the one who's going to defuse the bomb, eh? It's me, isn't it? So fucking shut your face. You know, she's not afraid to spunk him up a bit. Mm. <laughs> so, but we, we, we're we jumping ahead a little bit. Can I just... Yeah, sorry. Can, let's go back to the beginning. Because yeah. Goldeneye, very famously, starts with one hell of an opening stunt. Mm. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I, 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 I've been going on and on about how these films have been filmed in a way that's more enjoyable over the last three films or so, how the camera movements are becoming more modern and and dynamic, and it just Mm. means that an action sequence isn't completely dull like it used to be when it was, you know, Roger Moore cutting to a pigeon and then cutting back to him still on a gondola or whatever was happening. Um, (laughs) And... I think this film is a, a really good example of how far that's come at this point and how much more interesting it is just to see generic stuff blowing up and people running around with guns. And hmm. I think the opening in particular is, you know, one of a handful of scenes that goes beyond that and is actually just really cool with the hmm. Aeroplane stunt and the free falling. Do you know what? It's interesting to say that because those opening sequences felt a little flat to me. And I, uh, the the bungee scene was fine, and it's like there's no there's no music, and it's kind of played out in that way. It's nice. But then the next scene where they're all the fanning about with Sean Bean, and then the plane and all that, the, hmm. it just fell off somehow. And I thought it might be the editing was just off pace or something. It just needed more pace. And I think it was because there was no score on it. Hmm. Which was obviously a deliberate choice, but then it just, it it really slowed it all, it made it feel really slow and clunky. Hmm. And then, immediately after the opening credits, we go to this car chase sequence, and they've just got this kind of weird, funky bass line under it. And again, that (laughs) didn't work for me at all, and that whole chase sequence just felt really weird and unnatural, and just, and I think it was down to score, I I think that's what it was. The music for this one is often derided as being the very worst of the series. Um, Eric mm. Serra came in. This is his one and only time composing. And, it, th- yeah, they, it got to a point where they had to bring in another composer to sort of save one of the later action sequences because they were so, yeah, flabbergasted by what he did. I think they hired him thinking, oh, you're... Is he French? I think he might be. Um, they thought he was going to... I think he works with... Um, Luc Besson quite a bit. Oh, oh yeah. okay. And I think they thought he was going to bring something more modern and funky to it. And yeah, uh, yeah. Hmm. he went for a porn bass. <laughs> it does. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah. If I, I'm not one for like George Lucasing films, but <laughs> if if they could do this with a different score, I would be really interested to know what that would be like. Uh, to be honest, it was just those first couple of scenes that it struck me, and I. I forgot about it. I made a note about it, but then forgot about it. So obviously it didn't jump mm. out at me later on. I think there are some uh, moments yeah. that are just... I'm jumping ahead here. There's a bit where Bond is playing a card game with one of the villains, and you're on a top. And the yeah. music for that scene plays sort of almost like a love scene. Like, these two are romancing each other genuinely when they're actually, like, sending barbed comments to each other, and it should be played more for suspense than yeah. romance. Um, yeah, I just think the music misses the mark on a lot of key intentions here and there so uh, yeah we have our opening stunt sequence the bungee jump which was you know apparently a big record jump or whatever it was um Mm. but yeah very cool and they they really downplay it it looks it's 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 cool um then you know suddenly we got a load of russians a load of soviets i'm like oh this is thought this was over you know the soviets (laughs) are still the baddies and of course then the actual opening credits is essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union. A load of silhouette naked ladies mm. smashing the Soviet Union with sledgehammers. Yeah. <laughs> what did you guys think of it? Because obviously this is the first one where we have like proper CG and there's someone else doing it other than that guy who's been doing it for decades. Um, I loved elements and aspects of it. I loved the idea. I, I thought a lot of it was very bizarrely miscalculated. Hmm. Like, I, I can't... I, I mean, unless it was meant to be hilarious, which I doubt it. <laughs> that, like, the bit when there's that woman with 
a, a face on both sides of her head, and then she opens her mouth, and a gun <laughs> comes out. Ah, uh, yeah. It's yeah. like there's a, there's an animator on the internet that I'm a fan of called Syriac Karis, who creates these kind of warped, disturbing David Cronenberg uh, Photoshop After Effects animations, and it, it was very uh, evocative of that. Well, they, uh, they, there is a mention later in the film of a two-face something or other talking about Sean Bean's character. Mm. Janus, maybe? I don't know. I can't remember who they said it was. Yeah. But I thought it might be related to that. Oh, I it liked, is. Yeah, you're right. I liked that the that sequence had a narrative element, that it was saying, hey, look, the Soviet Union's collapsed, we're acknowledging it, and we're going to be dealing mm. with that today. Mm. Mm. I like that. It wasn't just an abstract, here's some kind of arty effects with some naked ladies. But it, yeah. but it was like, here's what we're saying. Can we get some naked ladies in there as well? Yeah, go yeah, on. There was no, there, yeah, can we just drape some naked ladies over this uh, Lenin statue? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the song isn't too bad as well. That that definitely helps. Yeah, what do you think of Tina Turner's Golden Eye? Yeah, it's alright. It's fine. <laughs> yes. It's not the best song, it's not the worst. It's uh... yeah, It's got a few, couple of moments, but then it's like the chorus is just a bit like... I like it. Golden eye found his weakness. Golden eye, you do what I please. Golden eye, no time for sweetness. But a bitter kiss will bring him to his knees. Uh, but yeah, then we have the return of the uh, Aston Martin DB5 for the first time in a while. It's quite cool. <laughs> What is Honestly, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. I know that's, that's a car, car, but I didn't, I didn't register that there was a different... Well, that, they say that, got a BMW? that was a returning car from previous films. Is that what the you're one saying? That, for God's sake, it's the it's the car from Goldfinger. It is the Bond car. car. Is it's, it the one that, that turns into a hovercraft? No, it, no, it's the one that he's driving at the start. Did you watch this? Yeah, I saw a man driving a car, and I didn't think twice about it. <laughs> yeah. When he goes to Q, doesn't Q say, oh, there's a new BMW? For yes, him? yes, that's the one later on. That's the blue one. He's got a silver one at okay. the very start when he's racing that uh, woman in the Ferrari. He's chasing... That woman is Famke Janssen. Yes, you know. she is. She becomes a major character in this film. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, he's got, <laughs> like, a psychiatrist in the car with him. Yes, and they were like, oh, just pop over to Monaco for a bit of <laughs> counselling. or whatever. Yes. <laughs> Where are they? Is it Monaco? It's got to be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Monte no Carlo. better place to relax, I don't think. I guess that's as good a place as any to analyse someone while he's speeding around a mountain. Yep. Yep. I thought that Having was meant to be race. Money Penny. It took me a while. To I did as well, it. yeah. Yes, I did. I was like, oh, but they rebooted he, Money Penny. Oh, I quite, like, I quite like this new Money Penny. She's, uh, <laughs> she's all right. <laughs> She's, yeah, yeah she's right. But then he got off with her, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's not Money yeah, Penny, yeah. is it? He can't, he can't kill that chemistry. The yeah. actresses do look very similar when we do find Money Penny later on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is Famke Janssen, who becomes a very big um, character in the story later on. Did it bother either of you that they meet, like, by happenstance, really? Um, I didn't. I don't think I even know who she is. What, then you're on a top? I know she's connected to the bad guys and all that, but is she yeah. just an agent, or is she... I wish she's one of the uh, the main bad guys, hench people. I know she's like the henchman, she's like... And the, they seem to be really going for like a Grace Jones feel. Mm. Uh, like, because she's like a physically tough hench woman. She's yeah. a hench woman. She's hench. Uh, yeah, she's exactly. fucking tonk. She's, she's fucking, a tonk woman. She's, she's peng. And she, <laughs> she'll... She will crush you with her <laughs> thighs of steel. Remington Steel. Her thighs of Remington <laughs> thighs Steel. Thighs of Steel. I bet you that's the name of one of the episodes. That, that'll be season four, episode three. Thighs of Steel. <laughs> so, I don't know. I didn't care about that, really. I guess Bond always meets people in a totally random way. It's not it's Oh, never no really... good. I'm, I'm glad to be hearing that, because it is, it is random. I mean, she is there in Monaco to steal this helicopter, and Bond just sort of happens to be there and uh, comes across this. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, you just let all that shit go with Bond, don't you? It's just like, you can't expect too much. Okay, no, fair enough. I I was I thought I was preempting some complaints that were going to be coming from either one of you, but I'm glad <laughs> to hear that you're sort of letting go of these logic questions. 
So yeah, she steals a helicopter. She shags someone to death first. Yeah, that scene then, always really confused me when I was very young. Like, when I first saw this when I was, like, 10 years old or something. I didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> I thought that because he has an accent, he's saying, I can't breathe. But it sounds like he's saying, I can't breed. And for the longest <laughs> time, me and my school friends thought that this is, like, something that people do when they want to have children. And you both have to be up for it, otherwise one of you will die. Zenya, I can't breathe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how old? How old are you talking about me? <laughs> I was about ten. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, hang on. So she kills someone. I'm not quite sure why. I guess he she managed to get access to the place because she killed him. I, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah, I didn't it's really, really confusing. Figure out what was going on with that. Why she needs to do that? Because she just seemed to walk on and then shoot the people who were in her way anyway. As she is killing him, you see a hand in the foreground reaching into his jacket and taking out his ID card. And then later yes. on, when she is on the boat, there is a man next to... The other fella's to... got it. Yeah, but we don't really get a good shot of him. I think it's just the same actor. And um, that confused me because I thought it was Bond stealing his ID. Ah, uh, right, Because Bond yeah. was coming to spy on her. Yeah. Um. So that was a bit... Yeah, I was just sort of like, you got to let it go, and you? Bond, you can't ask too many questions. Mm. Um, so yeah, she they steal this helicopter. Bond comes up with this amazing plan to stop them by running towards the helicopter, <laughs> and then just gets stopped by some guards. Which is amazing, like how uh, often that doesn't happen when he hasn't yeah. got a plan. Usually, he'll find some way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, they get away, and then we have this really long section where they go off. To somewhere in Siberia, whatever. Russia, Some, yeah. Servania. Yeah, like this little hidden computer station, space mm. station thing. And I was going to ask you, Calvin, this is a really long section, really long scene, mm. without Bond. Yes. And I and it struck me, and I was curious if you might know, what's the longest time in a Bond film without Bond, if you know what I mean? Ooh. Like in a sort of consecutive uh, thing because i, uh, I think because i suspect this must be the longest time and uh, uh, is there a few, is there a couple of opening sequences that he i was gonna say in? i bet you it's the opening of some film the one where it's like of... oh my god james bond is dead i think it's from russia with love because while there's someone playing a double of james bond the start mm. of that film is very much all of Spectre setting up their plan and doing all this stuff, and I don't think we see Sean Connery for about 15 minutes of the film. Yeah. Because um, there's, he there's is, a lot of preamble there. Is there technically he's in it, because he's playing the double of himself? Um, yeah, okay. Mm. But, I um, yeah, I mean, that's not Bond. It's not Bond, I'll give you that. Yeah, so, yeah, because there's a couple of Roger Moore ones as well that start with uh, a pre-title sequence without him in it. Right, I'm just going through from Rush with Love. Okay, so James Bond himself appears uh, 18 minutes in. Uh, obviously, he's Ooh, uh -huh. Sean Connery is playing a double at the start of the film. But uh, yeah, I think that is the longest from Rush with Love. Oh, you just had access to from Russia with Love at about 30 seconds notice there. We've just got these films lined up ready to go at all times. Yeah, we, we yes. haven't edited that down, <laughs> listener. That, that that was in real time. <laughs> yes, I have them here. Uh, yeah, but actually that's a, that's a good question, Alan. I think Norm, this, like, Calvin's it, got 24 TVs and DVD players in his room, <laughs> preloaded. I have the digital version. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but I mean, this is the kind of sequence that would normally have been like at the start of a Roger Moore Bond film, like when we see a space uh, yeah. ship get hijacked or a submarine go missing or any number of things. Like, this is that scene at the very start, and then you often go off and have Bond do some kind of fabulous stunt. I can only assume that because this was Pierce Brosnan's first film and Bond hadn't they been had on cinema screens there. for so long, mm. they needed to give him the classic car. They needed to give him a few action sequences, you know, a couple of attractive females and all that kind of stuff. And mm. then they can sort of move into the plot. They kind of need to set up Sean Bean right mm -hmm. at the start. 
Mm, mm. True. So that he can then come back later on and it sort of plays as a, a an interesting moment. Yeah. Mm. Or at least has it's the supposed to. superficial appearance of yeah, yeah, <laughs> being <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, we have all that, the big explosion. We have a, a survivor uh, who's not supposed to survive, who becomes our mm. Bond girl. She mm. gets she she runs off. We set up Alan Cumming, and you think, ooh, that's Alan Cumming. I bet he does something later as well. Um, <laughs> what is Alan Cumming? <laughs> like, uh, general, I mean, first of all, why, why do I have so much goodwill towards Alan Cumming? <laughs> because I don't think he's ever earned that from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think he's ever done anything to justify me liking him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, but he seems very likable. He's a camp icon. <laughs> yeah, but why? Like, I've only seen this is probably the best thing I've seen him in, or the best role I've seen him do. Maybe oh, Nightcrawler or whatever is, his name. I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the really good, like the quality I'm coming performance is. I mean, I know him as a comedian, a comedy actor, really. Mm. So it's not mm. like what do you expect? But uh, yeah, well, he, I think he's big on the stage, darling. <laughs> <laughs> but he, I mean, he doesn't even. They're not even making particularly good use of him here. Well, I mean, I, think I didn't even realize it was on him his career. for a few minutes. Yeah, is he, but is the character supposed to be comic relief? Yes, uh, a comedic villain, I think. Yeah, because I know he's the he's he's a bad guy in the sense he's doing the bad things, but he's not really he's not doing evil, is he? He's not like pulling the trigger, so to speak. Uh, he's like the tech, yeah, the evil oh, guy. He, he is guy. gun for hire. In in a slightly different alternate universe I could see him surviving to the end of the film and then coming back to help out Q and Bond in the sequel. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Mm. A lot of Scottish Russians in this. <laughs> 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 you got Robbie Coltrane coming up later. Uh, <laughs> I think yeah. it's a it's a homage to Sean Connery. I think that's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We briefly touched on uh, Sean Bean. He will be revealed to be the main baddie of the film later on. But for these early scenes, the ones that we have to sort of uh, go with are Zenya on a top, and then there's uh, Orumov, General Orumov, the Russian yeah. guy, um, who I think is a very underrated Bond villain. I think he has a great craggy face. He's got good line delivery. How did you guys I mean... feel about him? He looks like a generic cartoon Nazi Gestapo officer, like if you were just trying to draw one in to a cartoon for a scene. <laughs> well, he's got that face. I mean, yeah, I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if he's playing villains. Of... Yeah. Um, he's yeah. fine. He's very yeah. generic. Yeah. Like, beyond his physical appearance, I don't think he's. I don't think he's got. Or... I don't think he has the material to do anything. I'm not blaming the actor. It's, uh... He's fine. Yeah, I don't have a problem with him. Okay. And um, then you're on the tops providing us with some like uh, that sex scene that she has earlier on with the guy is quite raunchy here at the underground base. She's slaughtering pretty much everyone who works there with, with relish. She's sort yeah. of getting quite turned on and aroused by it. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah, she's definitely the kind of the evil one, the one who just enjoys killing mm. uh, and yeah, perhaps even aroused by it. And there's a scene later on where she she rapes James Bond. I think it was basically what was happening. It was a bit weird. Yeah, and yeah, she's like the real kind of psycho henchman, mm. which is quite cool. Like to have that character. I'm not sure Famke Janssen is comes across as that evil. Maybe she's just a bit too nice looking. Oh, really? I don't mean oh. like good looking, attractive. I just mean maybe yeah, she just seems too nice. Yeah. Like Grace Jones looks so severe. <laughs> all the time that you fear yeah. <laughs> maybe you just need someone a bit more you know but i mm. guess they wanted her to be sexy as well i guess that was the idea mm. but i know i know what you mean she's she's sort of like a hair away from playing the main bond girl it do, it just never quite comes together as a character the whole thing i know mm. what they're trying to do it just never quite comes together Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I I love her. I think she she's one of my very favorite bond hench people. I think she's fantastic. Yeah. Um Right, so we have a whole new sort of MI6 setup here. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead to that bit because we okay, yeah. do eventually go back to Bond in London. 
And we do have, a, you know, he goes in, he sees Money Penny, he's brought through to the briefing sort of with M, but it's done in sort of a very different way. There's a bit of handheld camera stuff. Money Penny's been called in. She's been out at the theatre with a date. She's sassy, uh, Money Penny. She is, yeah, woman of the She's 90s. Mid 90s girl power, uh, yeah. Money Penny, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is obviously, this is the interesting thing we've seen with Bond, uh, going through these decades of Bond, is the way that it changes to fit society. And and I think this is one of the more obvious things, uh, the, mm. the dealing with women in the world of Bond. Mm. Um, and yeah, we've got to a point where they'll, you know, they give as good as they get, which is mm. nice. But also, uh-oh, a woman boss... Oh no! <laughs> How will he deal with female authority? Oh, yeah. Goodness! As you can see, I have no problem with female authority. <laughs> yeah, Pierce Brosnan and uh, a, a new Bond. It doesn't seem a problem, but yeah, mm. you can't see Sean Connery kowtowing to Judy Dench, can you? Oh, no. <laughs> it just it doesn't it doesn't feel like that was there in old Bond. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really nice, and obviously, we we get a little bit of Judy Dench here, um, mm. and twenty years later, we we kind of get the conclusion of all that, and there's a real mm. nice character arc to that, which we'll, we've got to end, come up. Mm. But yeah, I I think it's a nice bit of casting, uh, an M who actually has some character, and mm. um, a proper actor, which is nice. Yeah. Not to denigrate the other M's, but, you know, they're just sort of boring old white men, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, I, I know they're doing, like, boring old white men MI6 spy guys. Like, that's what they're doing. Fair enough. Mm. But, yeah, this is a new world. Yeah. It was far more interesting than usual to have a new M brought in and the conflict that came with it. And, yeah, I agree. Mm. I, 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 um, I like that she called out James Bond for... The character's flaws as well. It, it got mm. a bit meta and self-aware. I didn't mm. like that she called him a sexist, misogynistic dinosaur or whatever it was, because it, it felt redundant to use both of those words <laughs> in the same sentence. <laughs> I didn't get it when she turned to Cameron and said, Bond is not a dog. What, what, was, <laughs> what did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> stand for well it depends i mean when you look at the uh the names of and it's it's, a, it's just a, a signed letter that i think fleming when he was writing to his mother he used to sort of refer to her as m so people sort of speculate that maybe that's where it came from i'm sure a better fleming scholar could give you a more accurate answer but the name of the first m is miles mesavi or mesavi something like that uh, i don't know how you pronounce it uh, so basically, all of the M's, like their names, have been M. I believe Judy Dench's M is Barbara Malsley, something like that. Mm. Ray Fines is, uh, yeah. Mickey. <laughs> Mallory. Yeah, so after that, we get the Q scene, mm. um, which stands for Quartermaster, by the way, Sol. Uh, <laughs> and Q, the Q scene is probably the best Q scene we've had. And that is definitely mm. down to the the I think the Brosnan Q the Brosnan Llewellyn chemistry is the one that really works mm, because yes. of like I said earlier that cheeky schoolboy nature it's mm. that so suits Q as the mm. kind of you know he's the school he's the old schoolmaster but you know he knows he he's got a bit of history himself so he knows what it's like um, yeah. and he enjoys all these gadgets so he understands why people want to play with everything. But he's mm. got to maintain this series. I really like it. I, I think it goes all the way through these films as we go along. Yeah, quite right. I, I kind of agree, but it's difficult to enjoy it because there's just this feeling that he's going to keel over at any Oh, I did second. notice in the wide shots when it was a two shot, he, like he, his eye contact is not on Bond at all. It's very like three feet over his shoulder. Yeah. Oh, cue yeah. Cards. He had cue cards. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, what? Is he 85 or something like that? <laughs> He's got, he's, and he's doing all this technical jum, mumbo jumbo that is just like it must be difficult mm. to learn that sort of shit. Well, even mm. even the bit at the end where there's a bit of a joke and Bond picks up his sandwich and he goes, "Don't touch that! It's my lunch." <laughs> <laughs> it it's very like performed to. I don't know. It's like he can't even see James Bond there in front. I don't know. It just is weird. He's going blind. <laughs> yeah, it does. It was like it's when like used to watch. Uh, 
Bruce Forsyth on the dancing show. Yeah. It's like you're just, oh, it's like a constant lottery. Every, he could just go at any second. He's, yeah. Oh, scary. <laughs> immediate, immediate quiz, Calvin. What's, what's Q's, what's Q's name in that first film? Uh, Major Boothroyd, Jeffrey oh, Boothroyd. There you go, you got it, you got it. Yeah. So I want to, just testing you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm glad you're enjoying him here. I think it's like I said with my uh, comments on his character in License to Kill. I think they've just they've, they nail him here. He's just that perfect eccentric tinkerer, yeah, jumping, bouncing back off Pierce Brosnan's schoolboyness, as you say, Alan. I think it just the chemistry works really well. It's funny. The scene's got a lot of good energy, despite there being mm. a lot of exposition. It's handled. Yeah. It's, it, you know, there's background stuff going off. There's like. Uh, uh, an yeah. airbag going off in a phone booth as he's doing some explaining. Yeah. It's it's a really I think it's a the best Q scene in this whole series, to be honest. I, I I agree with you, but all of those visual gags in the background, they all felt like placeholder gags. <laughs> like whoever wrote this one, oh, I'll just put that in and then I'll come up with a joke later. It does it does feel like Mike Myers wrote it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, very I don't Austin Powers style far. gags. <laughs> the, the the airbag in the telephone booth is a l is on its way there, but I think just where people are just like you know setting off ejector seats too soon and going flying off in the background and stuff, I think that's all fine. But I think this is where you can get away with it in Bond film. It's like this is where we we okay, it's the Q scene. We're gonna have a couple of little gags. Uh, we set up a gadget, nice one. That's that's what we want. That's what that's what we want from Bond, and we get it. It's nice. Mm. What's the gadget they set up again? Remind me. Well, he has the car. He <laughs> he has the belt uh, with the piton and the pen. You know what would have been amazing would be if, in the third act of the film, Bond gets trapped somewhere. Let's say he gets tied up with some rope or something, or he's, he's handcuffed, and he's like, hmm, and he reaches around and he can get into his jacket pocket, and he pulls out the sandwich that he stole <laughs> from Q, and he eats it, and it gives him the extra strength he needs to break free and karate chop the villain <laughs> like Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really I mean, good gag I think it's the best Q gag for Bond to be looking at a sandwich and then Q's like don't touch that, it's my lunch I think it's great I I mean it's not it's not a terrible gag I don't dislike it but I do feel like perhaps a bit to be desired in the execution I feel like Desmond Llewellyn is sort of too old to oh. be able to perform oh, it he's alright the yeah. whole thing feels reverse engineered you know i don't know it just doesn't quite play i feel like john cleese could do that bit a lot better oh you know? you're gonna regret yeah. saying that <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah we'll see we'll see <laughs> anyway uh we move to russia Ooh. uh bond is relaxing in a very lovely Hotel pool, I assume, some kind of spa, anyway. Uh, and then we have the scene with Zenya where, mm. as you alluded to earlier, Alan, she sort of gets a bit rapey. Yeah, very rapey. I, I, this this scene did uh, pop a question into my mind. I thought you might know the answer to this, Calvin. Who is the hairiest Bond? Sean Connery. Sean Connery, I think. <laughs> yeah. Definitely Does, Sean Connery. Is, is Brosnan second? He's just, I noticed his little rug chest there. Uh, yeah, you, you know, we never see Timothy Dalton with his shirt off, I don't think, so I can't speak oh. for him. But uh, yeah. Roger Moore was very smooth, as was George. I mean, I, 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 I'm just imagining what they'd all look like wearing those pants from Zardoz. And <laughs> it's definitely Sean Connery. Yeah, yeah. Sean Connery is definitely the hairiest. Is it true that Timothy Dalton's got a load of tattoos all over his chest? That's why they could never take his shirt off. Is it actually? No, yeah, like really like racist stuff. Really? <laughs> no. All right. Okay. <laughs> He's got a swastika tattooed on his chest. Uh, hey, I know someone who has shared a pool with Piers Brosnan. Me. <laughs> I did. Did you try and rape him? Hey, eh? try and get him uh, in the changing rooms. Did you crush no. him with your thighs of Remington steel? <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, um, you're a lot more polite than. Uh, yes, I want you on the top. <laughs> uh, no, I, I do really like this. Uh, yeah, this whole little fight oh, sequence. What nice. happens at the end of the scene? Does he win or does she win? Yeah, he wins because he drops her on the um, like the hot 
whatever it is where you put the water on for the uh, the sauna, he drops her on that, and then he, that. and she goes yo, and then jumps three feet in the air, <laughs> and steam starts shooting out of her ears. <laughs> is that uh, right? What yeah. happened at the end of the scene? I genuinely can't remember. No, no, no. He, he, she's, um, he's trying to sort of like bash her against the wall, yeah. um, as she's squeezing him, and then he eventually sees the uh, the hot plate thing, whatever it is, where you pour water, which creates yeah, the yeah. the steam, and then she, yeah, lets go, and he flips her over, and yeah. Then what? He just walks off. Well, no. He says, "Bring me to Yanis," and then she takes him to the. The site where all of the former communist statues are being held, and that's where Yanis Sean Bean is, Bond's oh, colleague. Yeah. What do you think Sean Bean would do if you called him Mr. Bean? Because <laughs> <laughs> that is his name. I don't think he'd be impressed, yeah. He, he looks like a seri- someone who takes himself very seriously. That must have happened, because he, he, he'll have lived his life to a certain point. Without Mr. Bean being a thing. And then <laughs> suddenly Mr. Bean will have been huge in the 90s, around the time this film was coming out, actually. And uh, there'll be a point where, like, his, his, you know, family and friends were going, Oh, Mr. Bean, you're Mr. Bean, aren't you? Do you think he liked that? Do you not remember <laughs> that story from a while ago when he was in a pub somewhere and someone made a, a unsavoury remark about his lady friend and he just like started fighting with the guy and <laughs> knocked him out and then went back in and finished his pint? No, of course I don't. Why would I read <laughs> stories about Sean Bean's personal life? I have no interest in the man whatsoever. <laughs> just... An ex-girlfriend of mine, her mum was at school with Sean Bean. Apparently he was a bully at school. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Which seems totally believable. Oh. Yeah. Um, so we have Sean Bean revealed as the main bad guy of the film. I'm guessing you probably What saw a this... twist! You, well, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you probably saw this coming because the start of the film has Sean Bean's name quite prominently in the credits for someone who dies in the first five minutes. Look, I, I really had very, very little concept of what Sean Bean was. I know the name. <laughs> but I, I like I I didn't know what he was. I I wouldn't if I saw him walking down the street. I wouldn't know who he was. I mm. probably still wouldn't, to be honest. And like it, that character at the start of the film, knowing nothing about Sean Bean or anything like that, it's just so obviously like he's in on it and he's gonna come back and he's not really dead. It's I mean maybe it's thanks to things like Kingsman and all these sort of post modern video game. Bond spoof type things that have come since this but I don't know it's just so obvious what they're doing mm. from the get go it's to do with the writing because these characters if it wasn't if it was just a character who's going to die and to give bond a bit of motivation it would be so much more throwaway or yeah. they would build it up in the same way they did with the Felix Leiter thing where it's just exactly, so yeah, obvious yeah. that it, the motivation here is revenge or whatever Whereas with this, I think it's because he has too much too personality, kind of, doesn't he? Yeah, too much personality, but then not enough time. Like, so it's like, yeah. well, something else yeah. has got to happen here. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to the very opening when they introduce him, though, I I think my favorite moment in the film, one of my favorite moments in the franchise, is when uh, James Bond is in that room and all the bad guys have guns pointed at him. Mm. And then he just sort of very slowly walks across the room with yeah, a barrel yeah. full of explosives in front of him, yeah. uh, on a, in like a trolley. Oh yeah, I really liked that. I yeah, thought that was good. really funny. I thought it, it, was nice. it was like genuinely a nice personality moment. You got a sense of his character from it, but it was also you know it's quite a nice little action beat. Yeah. But plus, what I, I, I really liked really about liked it, it is that they have this squeaky wheel sound effect. <laughs> but they just looped like thirty times. <laughs> it was exactly the same noise over and over. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I loved it. Uh, that's what I want from a James Bond film. I'd, I'd like, you know, fair enough. Free fall after an airplane and all that shit. That's fine. But I'm more interested in awkwardly squeaking a trolley <laughs> across a room. <laughs> mm. Give me more of that. 
I mean, some of the logic here doesn't quite work out, uh, you know, just going back to that opening scene, now that Sean Bean's been revealed as the villain, why would they go to the effort of faking his death if Bond is the only one there and they presumably... Oh, it's absurd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's ridiculous. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, and I think it's the kind of thing that with a bit of quick rewriting, you could have sort of extrapolated some reason why they would have wanted Bond to escape, but they they don't really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Sean Bean is nonetheless our villain, and it's one of the tropes that they like to do in this series every now and again, where the villain is like the dark side of Bond, pretty much. And you can't get more clearly draw a clearer parallel than having 006 be the main Bond villain. Was was Sean Bean on the shortlist to take over as Bond? I don't believe he was. I think they kind It of... seems like someone who would be in the reckoning, wouldn't it? You oh know? yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think the problem is he can't do the voice. He can't, <laughs> he can't do that. <laughs> Hello, this is posh well... Sean Bean. <laughs> I've come to shag you love before I save your life. He's quite good here, actually. I think his accent's pretty alright. Mm. I mean, Piss Brosnan can't really do the voice either, and they let him play Bond. <laughs> <laughs> what is the voice he kind of... He kind of does a, like... Uh, what's... What is it? I know the Russian failsafe systems. You just don't walk in and ask for the keys to the bomb. You need the access codes. I, I, what is he do? I don't know. I, I, Piss Brosnan's accent baffles me. Like, I just can't wrap my head around it. gets worse as it? they go on. Um, a bit like Sean Connery became more and more Scottish as <laughs> his ones went on. Brosnan becomes more and more sort of transatlantic, like American-Irish. Yeah! That's what it is, because it's not just a an Irish accent, is it? And I I get the impression that's just what he talks like. Oh, that's yeah. what his normal voice is. Yeah. It's just a very weird mishmash of different accents. Mm. Mm. Anyway, we get a lot of exposition here about Alec's motivations for wanting revenge against the British government because his parents were Lienz Cossacks who were Russian people betrayed by the British government who were killed. Uh, Yeah, it's it's a lot. If there was ever a need for a flashback, this would be it. Plus it's unnecessary. Just make it simpler. Yeah, yeah. Make it just he's defected because he wants the money. Because that's the that's the motivation for the crime, isn't it? Of yeah. what they're actually doing. Yeah. And then do they want to? But then it's not even like they make it personal. It's not like something between him and Bond. Mm. It's about I nations. Know, I don't know. Which I, I I don't think really works. But yeah, I guess what all they're doing is highlighting that you know the British government betrayed these people. And, mm. I don't know. What, I think it's interesting a shining a light on the greyness of spy work and particularly when you look back on the cold war it is kind of gray it's uh not necessarily good and bad or maybe it is no it is yeah sorry you can cut that (laughs) (laughs) well yeah okay so they tranquilize bond yes instead of killing him yes and then put strap him in a helicopter instead of killing him yes and then I think the idea is they've rigged the helicopter to shoot at itself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to kill him. Yes. And then he just headbutts the th- <laughs> And then he headbutts himself to safety. <laughs> how did they how did they overlook the fact that there was a fucking eject button <laughs> right next to him? <laughs> it's that seems like an unsafe ejector system. To be perfectly honest with you, <laughs> that feels like a system that could be accidentally triggered. Like if yeah. you're wearing a full helmet and do a sort of a, a, a sharp turn. Yeah, if if, <laughs> if Bohemian just... Rhapsody comes on on the radio, <laughs> if you start like going, oh no! Well, I like that he doesn't immediately go for that. He's sort of looking around at his options first, and he hits a couple of wrong buttons. <laughs> yeah, he headbutts the button, and then the windscreen wipers start going. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the first time they meet, isn't it? Him and the Bond girl. Because yes. we've we've seen a lot of her up at this, this point, which I think goes... She's been in the film for nearly an hour. Yeah, which goes to say, like, she was established as a character in her own place rather than as the Bond girl. Yeah. I think yeah, that yeah, works yeah, yeah. quite nicely, actually. Very yeah. uh, unusual for this franchise at this point, yeah. 
And I like that the first thing that she does when they meet is he's like helping her out of the back and then she kicks him in the shin and goes running off because as she would, she's been, you know, very untrusting of people around her. But then they're both taken captive and then they form some kind of a of a bond. A James oh, bond. Oh god. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, god. Yeah, then they bang for some reason. There's a whole thing what? with a they have sex. No, they don't, not yet. Oh sorry. They're taken captive uh, by the Russian officials who uh, think that they are. Oh, they get interrogated, yeah. Yes, yes. No one takes the time to do a good interrogation anymore. Uh, And then Orumov comes in and he's obviously been drinking, which is a nice detail that I quite like. He's sort of like hiccuping as he comes in, but he's not playing it (laughs) too strongly. But um, I like that he obviously got the news that Bond and this girl were still alive and he's shitting it, so he's heavily drinking and. Uh, yeah, but then they we have a little chase here around the uh, the ministry, the Russian ministry. Some good stuff, uh, a lot of stuff that might remind people of the video game when they're in the archive section. Um, yeah. And this is all building up to the tank chase, which is a pretty big uh, scene in the film. Are we ready to talk about that? Yeah. Because this is the scene that they drafted in another... Uh, composer to do the score for because you can hear the original track I think it's probably on, it must be on YouTube it's certainly on the CD uh, and it's really horrible so they brought in a different composer whose name uh, escapes me at the moment but he did a proper more traditional Bond theme score for this particular action sequence but I love this whole stuff with the tank like going around the streets, uh, chasing the car, really nice stuff yeah, I I did find it a bit boring, as these things tend to do <laughs> for me. But I liked what they were doing with it and trying to keep it interesting, trying to keep it fresh. The fact that it's a tank, uh, it obviously, mm. is quite interesting. And, and so it's smashing through building. It's going on a car. It's got a statue on top of it. I liked what they were trying to do, and I think it worked. But, you know, it still goes on for about 20 minutes. And then after that, we have a tr- sequence on the train. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bond saves the girl, the villains escape, but Orimov is killed. It's just, it feels like, again, it just needs to be half an hour shorter. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's just, just, yeah. It's like, by the time yeah. they're on the train, they're having to escape from that. It's just like, how many times are you going to escape? Come on. Yeah. Well, we, we are an hour and a half into the film at this point, I suppose, and it's sort of after this sequence. It ends with uh, Bond and Natalia kissing each other. I guess she's sort of been brought around to him now. Um, yeah. And then they go off to Cuba, where the final act of the film takes place. Yeah. Yeah. So they're looking for a giant satellite dish that, is, oh, that doesn't exist because uh, no one can see it. Mm. It turns mm. out it's underwater. Yes. Yes. In some kind of obvious model work that bothers me a bit because this is a real place. Yeah. There's model work in, there was some model work earlier when the planes were crashing after the EMP. Yeah. In the opening scene that was like, yeah, this is real kind of nineties model work. <laughs> it yeah. was a little it was just a little bit dated. It's good work, yeah. but you know, by today's standards. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But I mean that real life location and they actually went there to shoot some of the shots, it's very impressive. Uh this huge dish. Yeah. Uh do one of you know what it's actually called? It seems like the kind of thing you'd know. Nah, no. no. Oh, okay. Mm. Oh, well, um, (laughs) this is where uh, the scheme of the villain sort of becomes apparent. He's going to use this EMP satellite to send Britain back to the Stone Ages or Dark Ages, as he puts it, um, and transfer all the money out of the Bank of England. Yeah, it's it's flawless. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a pretty good good scheme. The problem with this sort of thing is... If it's not like physical money, if it's not our gold mm. or something that we can go, look, this is what we're stealing. It just doesn't yeah. feel real because the economy isn't real. It's just a load of bullshit numbers that people make up. So it just feels like, eh. like you have a, sc- a computer screen that says loading 87% and you have to wait for it to get to 100. And then it's like, yes, we've transferred $87 billion. <laughs> and it's just a bit like, eh, yeah, okay, computers, we get it. Do you know what I mean? Okay. It's just not cinematic. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Xenia also dies here uh, around this point. Uh, yeah, that kind of crushed. happened without me noticing. I don't really... Oh, okay. 
bit of an anticlimax. And what's his name? A- 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 Romanov. He he dies at some point. Oh, Romanov. Yep, he's shot on the train. Yeah, yeah. But we have our big, big, the big duel between him and yes, Alec. Which really well choreographed fight sequence, I think. Quite brutal. Both of them are yeah. bleeding. Yeah, I I thought this is preborn. This is this is pretty good actually for for a preborn mm. world. Uh, you know, mm. we 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 we've talked about how Bond changes to fit with the new sensibilities of the twenty first century. But this is pretty mm. pretty hardcore, isn't it? Yeah, you won't get Roger Moore doing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and the actual actor is doing a bit like Timothy Dalton. Really, the actual actor is doing a lot of the. You know, the yeah. lighter stunt work, I suppose, yeah, which helps. Yeah, definitely the lightest. And then we have a big dramatic moment. Trevelyan like, falls off the, the ladders. Mm. I did like how they you, you see him falling and you see the like the, you know, a dummy full of, full of straw falling. <laughs> and then <laughs> a great shot of him just smashing into the ground. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> His body's like you don't usually see the impact. <laughs> That's quite brutal. Um, yeah. It's like the opening sequence of Mr. Bean, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Slams to earth. Oh, someone can someone do an edit of that, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. It is quite nice. Like the dummy really does. Like the the sort of ankle breaks. The yeah. foot's facing the other way around. It's like it's it's really quite a brutal um, moment. And I yeah. love that 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 didn't even kill him. He's still alive. Yeah, yeah, quite like that. Just for no real reason. Just to give it a little bit of like extra death. Oh yeah, because it's yeah. not like he does Which I anything. Like. Yeah. I like that Bond like drops him, uh, like it, it, sort of like he does. It is a bit of a cold kill, but I, I yeah. do like that. He goes, "Long live the king," and then he just <laughs> lets go. Really and good. I do like all the stuff we didn't really talk much about it, but all the climax stuff before with like the twiddling of the pen and Bond is looking at it to see how yeah. he clicks is, is done. Oh God! Yeah, how does how does that pen work? Three clicks, arm the four second fuse. Two clicks disarm it, but then, but then Bond does three clicks, and then M, not M, Q is like, "What you think I'm scared?" Or is it four clicks that disarm <laughs> it? Oh, I can't remember. Sorry, it I was three what, to. What ar- I, I thought it was three to arm it and three to disarm it. No, but I think then... it's three to arm it and then four to disarm it. I'm just. But then to that Bond point in the does. <laughs> Bond then arms it in front of Q to like wind him up. Yeah, and yeah. he takes it off him and, and clicks it, and then says, "Don't be silly, James 007. Yeah. Don't play silly buggers around my pens." <laughs> so is that? Oh, right. So it's just a shit film because I mean it's well after three <laughs> seconds that he takes it off him. No, it isn't. I've timed it. <laughs> <laughs> It felt like ages. Oh, I think it is three three clicks. One sec, let me just listen to this. This is a class four grenade. Three clicks, arms the four second fuse, another three disarms it. Right, yep. Three disarm it. Alright, and then play the next bit where Bond does it. Let's time it. <laughs> another three disarms it. How long did you say the fuse was? Oh, grow up. 007. They all said the pen was mightier than the sword. Thanks Bottom to me, they were right. right. Very quick, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, but in the how, times, how, are, there. how are you meant to? How are you meant to keep track of that thing? Well, it's quite simple. <laughs> well, it's not though, is it? If if you put it down, like now, it, Bond's pressed it three times, and then he's pressed it through. But then someone else could come along, press it once to write something, and then. <laughs> You don't know how many well, times it's been pressed. Well, that's why he's watching Boris so closely. Yeah. Mm. It's not supposed to write. What if you accidentally click it while it's in your pocket? Yeah, that's what I mean. Well, then that's a problem. It's bad. To, it feels like a bad design to me. Like, yeah, it feels like you have to. You should squeeze the the nib and then click and hold, hold, press and hold. That's what you want. Yeah. For simplicity's sake, I'm glad that they just have it the way it is. I'm glad they don't go into this pedantic list of rules to satisfy Soul <laughs> 25 years after the film is released. I think it'd be better as well if if instead of blowing up, you clicked it three times and then spikes come out of it and <laughs> stab the person in the hand <laughs> who's holding it. 
Oh, you click it three times, and then it just dumps all the ink out of it. It just creates <laughs> it just stains your shirt. It's really annoying. Uh, no, I. <laughs> you click it three times, and it's it squirts the contents all over you. And what it actually has on it, instead of ink, is really tasty beef gravy. <laughs> and what <laughs> what happens is at the end of the film. James Bond's being chased by some guard dogs, <laughs> and then and then he like he tricks the bad guy. Sh- James Bond's hiding up a tree, and he he convinces Sean Bean <laughs> to like write down his will for him or something. He goes, "Go on, just write that down for me." And then Sean Bean gets gravy all over all over him, and the, <laughs> and the dogs eat Sean Bean. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's as good a gadget as any of them. <laughs> you could write that into the script backwards, like you do with any James Bond gadget. But <laughs> pay attention, 007. <laughs> Simply click this pen three times and it shoots beef cra- beef gravy. Uh, anyway. <laughs> and, then, and then he could... And then he could do it and put some gravy on his sandwich that he's eating for lunch. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a nice little punchline at the end. Yeah, there you go. Oh, dear. Um, well. So what else happens? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we are at the very so end I'm of impressed. the film now. Uh, Natalia's gone off and done her computery stuff. Um, Boris is frozen alive. Uh, after everything oh, blows yeah. up around him, we get one last gag with Alan coming. Quite nice. And yeah. saying I am invincible, and then the yeah liquid nitrogen, whatever it is, uh, comes and freezes him. Which I liked. Yeah, I think there's some good gags with him as well. It's like where Sean Bean gets the one goon over and is like, if he moves, kill him. And the guy just takes a gun out and points it at him, and Alan Cumming reacts to it really nicely. I think. Uh, and then I like that they go off kind of like joking. She's like, oh no, no more planes. And they do seem like yeah, they're having a nice. She actually might like him rather than just yeah. shagging him. <laughs> yeah. Well, how many of them would just end with the you know him in the shower with the girl or in bed with the girl or whatever? And this is like you know they they, they go off laughing, having a little joke. It seems like there's chemistry. Well, that's uh, it. I think that's the nat- I think that's a natural consequence of you creating a fully sort of rounded character for the female yes. <laughs> role instead of you know just someone for him to shag. Mm. I think it would have been better if. It had ended with him in the shower with, with her, like the other films, but with <laughs> um, Q watching on hidden camera, and then Q could Q could go, "That's my lunch." <laughs> <laughs> no, he should have. <laughs> he should have. Uh, yeah, they just they're in a clinch, you know. They they they're holding each other tight, and then she goes, "Oh, what's that?" And he was like, "Oh, sorry, darling, I got beef gravy all down you there." <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened to me before. <laughs> you must have clicked my clicker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Golden Eye. Yes, this has all sounded quite positive. This must be the most positive Bond show we've ever had on this, and it's only taken three and a half years. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... Yeah, don't get too excited. Yeah, don't, no, don't, I'm sure you're going to give it like a four and a five anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall we rate it on that uh, on that bombshell? So we find yes. out what we've given it. Yes, On that Bond shell. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I enjoyed it. I think there was definitely a few bits where it's still, you know, just a Bond film. And that does have a limiting uh, thing. <laughs> But I, I I gave it a seven, and a kind of optimistic seven where I feel like, okay, I like Piers Brosnan, I like what he's doing. So give me a slightly stronger script, some kind of perhaps some ideas that we aren't just doing the same thing over and over again. This could definitely get better. I think what we're really missing here, which what we what we've been missing for a few films now, is a really good villain, like a really mm. good central villain that's kind of really get hold of. Um, so hopefully we'll uh, get that soon. Well, yeah, a few films down the line, we've got a guy with diamonds in his face, so <laughs> can't go wrong. Can't wait, can't wait. 
Yeah, I, I largely agree with that. Um, it, it feels very optimistic, like you say, like everything's there for a good film, except maybe like a script that's quite good enough. Um, mm. It's difficult to feel that positive because I felt so positive about the first half of the previous film, which also left me feeling very positive, like we were moving towards something good. And to be honest, I preferred the first half of um, whatever the last one was called. License to Kill. Uh, yeah. Oh. I preferred the first half of that to all of this. But then obviously that film just becomes so boring and dull as it goes on. But then, you know, this this film, it never quite reached the same heights as that one for me. But it was also consistently a lot more... This was just kind of base level, like, yeah, I can sit through this, yeah. It was like watching um, Tomb Raider 2 with Angelina Jolie or some <laughs> shit like that. Just kind of average, inoffensive <laughs> action movie. Yeah. Um, but it was far too long, like all these Bond movies are, and I did get bored near the end, but not as much as some of the other ones. So, like, it's okay, and I agree that I kind of hope that one of the next Pierce Brosnan films is really going to surprise me, but I am aware that this is generally considered to be the best one from the Brosnan era, so mm-hmm. I don't have massively high hopes yeah. on that front. I think, realistically, I'm probably not going to love a Bond film until the Craig era, if I'm going to love any of them. Uh, but no, I gave it a 6 out of 10. It's okay-ish. It has some nice moments. Hmm, okay. Well... That's positive. I, I wish we'd watched these in reverse order now, the Daniel, the Pierce Brosnan <laughs> ones, so that we built up to this. Cause <laughs> I, I can't imagine you have will have much optimism um, <laughs> after the next few. Or maybe you will. Maybe you'll be surprised. Well, it's a ten from me. <laughs> uh, this it, 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 this bands around sort of my top tier of my Bond rankings. Uh, I, 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 for a long period of time, I would say it was my favorite. It probably has been my favorite for consistently the longest period of time. Um, I love everything going on in this. I think Brosnan's, re- I think Brosnan's Bond is the best of the Bonds be- because mm-hmm. he uh, is an amalgamation of so much of what made the previous yeah. ones great, and I think he does it really, really well. I think his before his acting will get a bit hammier in some of the later ones, and we'll talk about it then. But here in Goldeneye, I think he's fairly spot on. I love all of the various elements at play, the action sequences. I think this is the best ensemble of villains in the entire series. Maybe not necessarily for one particular standout, maybe Zenyuron on the top mm. as henchperson, but I think as a as a group they work really well. The four main ones. Uh, the only thing that sort of works against it is the music score if that was uh a bit different yeah well now uh, you can't get higher than a 10 anyway it's 10 out of 10 hmm. well i wow. I've, I've just looked up and yeah. of the I think that's our highest rated bond isn't it yeah of the films we've done so far i gave goldfinger an eight golden eye a mm. seven and those are the only ones above a six so like that's my second best bond film so far it's pretty good mm. yeah you know what I, uh, Goldfinger is higher rated amongst the three of us. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's surprising. You were both quite optimistic then, though. Yeah, I th- I hadn't had my James Bond optimism slowly like <laughs> beaten out of me relentlessly over the course of 17... The Roger Moore era. Two and a half hour <laughs> sludge. Like, yeah, just... Uh... And I, yeah, I'm a bit disappointed, honestly, because I, I thought maybe the Pierce Brosnan era would be it for me when I finally got on board, but I, I think I am going to be waiting for Daniel Craig at this point. Mm. Well, you never know. Let's see what happens mm. next. When will we be looking at Bond next, Sol? Um, don't know. <laughs> All right. Oh, dear. November, November, uh, early November. <laughs> I think our yeah. viewers should let us know if they would want us to uh, review all the Pierce Brosnan films before No Time to Die comes out. So we would be reviewing Die Another Day going into No Time to Die. We can make this (laughs) the year of Bond, guys.
We will be back next week with something a little bit special. Ooh, there'll probably be some Bond stuff next week. To yeah. Be next week is episode 200 of this illustrious <gasps> podcast. For the best part of four years. Goodness. We've been doing it. And we're going we're gonna to do uh, something similar to when we did episode 100, where we were doing a big quiz spectacular. We're just going to do loads of quizzes and games and things rather than review specific film. But better than last time. Different to last time. <laughs> it remains to be seen how it, well it will work. <laughs> so, yes, join us next week. One for the fans. And Bond will return. Probably in a couple of months or something when we get around to it. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here!